Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to July's TBC Power Hour. Our topic today that uh, we're happy to uh, discuss and present to you is defining and working with grid and ground coordinates. So um, this is a very, very uh, common, uh, almost daily, or if not almost, then definitely daily uh, um, concept for us surveyors. And um, there's a lot of questions or misconceptions or uh, just general um, knowledge that we'd like to share or clear up or answer for you with this presentation. Um, there's a lot of people on the call today. And so if you're new to the TBC Power Hour series, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, just a quick overview on how these sessions work. Um, we'll go into a brief introduction of the topic, go into some uh, demo. Uh, with it today, it's going to be uh, between Trimble Access and Trimble Business Center. And then at the end, there should be some time to answer your questions. Um, we won't uh, interrupt uh, the pre uh, presenter, um, Mr. Um, Mark White from Duncan Parnell, our uh, Trimble distributor in the Southeast United States, until the end. So ant ask your questions, and we'll come back to them at the end. If you don't, uh, if we don't have time, or if we don't get to your questions, we have them all logged. We can um, reach out to you then offline. And we'll also have two poll questions at the end as well. So my name is Joe Blecka. I am the product manager for TBC. I'm based in Westminster, Colorado. Um, there is my email address. If you have any questions about this presentation or anything that comes up you don't think about, I'm always available. And I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And our all-star today is Mark. Uh, he's the training and support manager. You'll be hearing from him most of the time, thankfully, because my voice gets really, really sick, or I get sick of listening to my own voice after a while. So uh, we'll have uh, Mark take it away. And um, you'll hear from me at the end kind of with some follow-ups. So uh, take it away, Mark. Thank you very much, and uh, um, we appreciate your time here. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Like Joe said, my name is Mark White, and I'm a licensed surveyor in the great state of North Carolina. I'm the training and support manager for Duncan Parnell, and we're the geospatial distributor for Trimble in uh, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, and Virginia. So I've spent the last 11 and a half years doing training and support for Duncan Parnell, and, and during that time, I've had a lot of questions come up over and over again. And it seems like in the last few years, as the economy has gotten better here in the United States and guys are getting really busy again, I get a lot of phone calls about, hey, why, you know, why don't my coordinates match up or these distances don't match up or somebody wants something in grid and I really don't understand what they're talking about or I got a customer that wants something on the ground and, and I'm not sure how to do that. So I was talking to Joe a few months ago and I said, man, I'm going to do a webinar for our customers just to, because I got so many questions about grid and ground and how to set up coordinates and things like that. So I told him I was going to do a webinar for our customers and he invited me to, to come share it on the power hour. So here we are. I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys, I'm not a geodesist. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the theory of how it works. We're going to spend a lot more time on the practical side of it, looking at software and how do I set this up to get this result? How do I set that up to get you know the result that I want? Not necessarily talking about the theory or the math behind everything and how it works. But I am going to give a basic overview of state plane coordinates and ground coordinates because we do need to have some basic understanding there. And um, this really works for any projection. I'm using state plane because I'm here in the United States. Some of you guys that are might be around the world, you know, this the the theory behind a projection is pretty much the same. So it should should uh, ring true for that as well. We're going to take a look at a little demo time with Trimble Access and, and some TBC demonstration, and then Joe's going to cover some next steps, and like he said, we'll have a Q&A at the end. So to get things rolling, we'll kind of cover an overview of what I plan to cover this morning. And like I said, I, I kind of did a, a presentation for our customers, and it was about an hour-long presentation, and talking to Joe last week, he's like, well, 
we're trying to keep things to 40 minutes so I'll try to talk fast I might run a little bit long uh, but I'll try to talk I'll try to talk fast but not too fast so we're going to cover a basic explanation of the state plane coordinate system or coordinate systems in general and how they work with with horizontal ground coordinates as well then we're going to take a look at Trimble access now I know this is the TBC power hour but you know Field software and office software go hand in hand, they're integral to each other, and if we understand how to set things up properly in the field with our data collector, um, we're going to understand how to set things up in the office as well, and things are going to flow together and work together. So in Access, we're going to take a look at four different ways to set up the data collector, one using a scale factor that equals one, and why we're going to use it, when we're going to use it, uh, setting up a scale factor that's not equal to one, why we would use that and how to set it up. Then we're going to look at setting up a job in access using state plane grid coordinates. And finally, we'll cover state plane ground coordinates in Trimble Access and, and how to set it up to, to use state plane but get everything scaled up to ground or down to ground. <laughs> so then we'll look at Trimble Business Center. And it's really going to flow right along with Trimble Access. Uh, we'll do scale factor one, scale factor not one. We'll look at setting up a project in U.S. state plane coordinates. And then this is a question I get a lot from guys. They'll be like, hey, I went out in the field. I did a bunch of measurements using state plane. Now I need it in ground because, you know, I'm doing some cadastral surveying. It needs to be ground distances or the customer's asking for it in ground and I've got it in grid. How do I do that? How do I set up? my project so I can scale things to ground. So we'll take a look at the local site settings there in TBC and how to set that up as well. So let's give, again, this is going to be a basic overview. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you again, I'm not a geodesist. I'm a land surveyor and I, and I listen to people's support issues all the time. So this is more of a, just a really basic overview so we understand kind of what's going on with the state plane coordinate system or any coordinate system and how it translates with scale factors and and ground coordinates so with US state plane back in 1932 a couple of North Carolina highway engineers a guy named OB Bester and George Syme had the idea that it'd be nice to have a coordinate system to cover the whole state and you know something that used rectangular coordinates would make their job a whole lot easier because then they could do math on a flat surface so they pitched this idea to the US Coast and Geodetic Survey who ran with it and created the state plane coordinate system. There's two different kind of projections we're using in state plane and I throw this out there um, because you're going to see it in the software as you look through different settings. There's the Lambert conformal projection which is used in states that are longer east-west and the transverse Mercator projection which is used in states that are longer north-south. Now in state plane, and, and this is true usually for, for most coordinate systems, in state plane we try to keep the zones under 158 miles wide because that's going to keep our scale ratio within 1 in 10,000. Basically, we've got to keep the zones a certain size so we don't have too much distortion. So if you think about it, we're, we're taking the round earth surface or the elliptical earth surface and we're flattening it out into that flat state plane grid so that it's easier to do the math and so that we can use rectangular coordinates. Well, if you think about taking a ball and lopping a piece off of that ball and laying it down on a table and trying to flatten it out on the table, there's going to be some distortion, right? It's not going to flatten out perfectly. So the bigger the piece we lop off, the more distortion there's going to be. And if we keep these zones under 158 miles wide, then we can keep the distortion down below 1 in 10,000, which is usually acceptable for most land survey uh, applications there. So here this is looking at three different states and kind of shows you the way the zones, different zones work. So depending on the size of the state, you may have multiple zones in your state. Like Texas, for example, over here on the left. It's Lambert conformal. You can see the zones run east to west, but it's got five different states to keep each zone, or five, excuse me, five different zones to keep them below 158 miles wide. And then if we look at Missouri down here at the bottom right, you can see it's transverse Mercator. It's running north to south. And there's three zones in order to keep those less than 158 miles wide. Then we have North Carolina up at the top right. It's a Lambert projection. It's running east to west. But North Carolina is skinny enough that they actually just use one zone here. 
I throw this out there because this is a phone call I get every now and then too. And I think of one particular case a few years ago where a guy called me up and he's like, hey man, I got I got real problems here because I loaded this coordinate file onto my data collector. I hooked up to the VRS network and I went to check into one of my control points and it's telling me I'm six million feet off. And so we started looking at his coordinate settings and this guy had always worked in Georgia West. I'm based out of Atlanta, so I might tell you some stories about guys I know in Georgia, but I won't name any names. But this guy was working in Georgia West and or he had always worked in Georgia West. He got a job down in on the coast in Georgia. So when he went down there, he didn't think to set his data collector up any different. So he loaded the coordinates in there, went and checked into a control point and was six million feet off. When we looked at it, we said, Hey, you're in Georgia West, just switch to Georgia East and everything worked out. But it's important to know that there's multiple zones depending on where you're working and you really need to be in the right zone or you're going to end up in the wrong place. Fortunately, he checked into something there. So let's take a look at a cross-section example of a uh, state plan coordinate zone. Now this comes straight out of the Georgia DOT manual, so if any of you GDOT guys are on the call, a shout out to you. I didn't, I didn't copy it, but I did draw my own little example using their manual. So let me turn on my laser pointer real quick just so we can see a little bit better. We're going to really focus on three different surfaces today as we kind of talk about what you know, a coordinate projection is. We've got our ground surface up here, or a horizontal surface where we do our survey work, right? Then we've got our ellipsoid, and this is the mathematical model of the Earth that we use for our projection. So all the math dealing with our projection is done down here on the ellipsoid. And then we take that ellipsoid and we flatten it out into a flat grid so we can use rectangular coordinates and it's easier to do the math there. You can see we got our 158 mile wide section down here showing the, uh, the, the actual state plane zone and the width there. And then there's one other, um, one other surface I want to throw in here real quick, and that's a geoid. If you guys aren't familiar with the geoid model, I'm sure most of you guys have heard that term before. In the simplest terms, the geoid model represents where sea level is, where mean sea level is. So when we're measuring in a known projection and we're doing the math along the ellipsoid, we're actually getting our elevations as heights relative to that ellipsoid. But if we want our data to be referenced to mean sea level, we can add a geoid model, and then we take that height, when we're on the ground, we take the height above the ellipsoid, then we subtract off the difference between the ellipsoid and the geoid, and that gives us an overall sea level elevation. So I added that slide in here. Oh yeah, go ahead, Joe. I got a question. So in this cross-section example, you show the geoid below the ellipsoid. Is there any instance where the geoid would be above the ellipsoid? Yes, there may be, you know, depending on where you are in the world as you, uh, in certain other areas, it sure could be. Yeah, it's just like in my area where I am, it's, it's usually below. So when I always draw it up, I just always think to draw it up there. But yes, it could be above the ellipsoid for sure. Okay, thank you. All right. So again, I throw that in there because when we get into the settings in Access and TBC, um, we're actually going to select a GOA model to load into both of those softwares because the software is going to use that in some of its calculations when it is coming up with the elevation scale factor and different things like that. So back to the three uh, the three surfaces that we're going to deal with here in the next few minutes. We've got our ground surface our ellipsoid, which is our mathematical model of the Earth, and then we've got our state plane grid that we're, we're using there. So when we look at this, our state plane, or I'm sorry, our ellipsoid and our state plane grid, where those two meet, we have what are called our standard parallels. And at that point, our scale projection is going to be equal. But remember, we're taking a, a round surface and we're flattening it out, so there's going to be some distortion there. In between our standard parallels, we're going to have to use a scale factor that's going to be less than one because our scale projection is too small in there. So we're actually going to be scaling from the ellipsoid down to the grid. So where the grid and the uh, ellipsoid touch, it's going to be equal. In between those standard parallels, we're going to use a scale factor smaller than one to scale down from the ellipsoid to the grid. And outside our standard parallels, 
our scale projection is too large, so we're actually going to use a scale factor that's larger than one to scale from the ellipsoid to the grid. I get phone calls sometimes from guys that say, hey, you know, I think something's wrong here. I'm used to I'm used to having a scale factor that's smaller than one. Now I got a scale factor that's larger than one. What you have to remember is it really depends on where you are. I had a guy call me a couple of weeks ago that was working in North Carolina and he got right up near the Virginia border. And so his scale factor was above one and he was a little bit concerned because he'd never seen that. He was used to working between the standard parallels. So just know that depending on where you are, you may have scale factors that are scaling less than one. You may have scale factors that are larger than one. So here's my little cross-section example of taking shots up on the ground and I drew some plumb lines in here. Not the greatest artist in the world. I have trouble drawing stick figures. But in this example, we take a shot here on the ground, we plumb our rod up and you'll see we have our plumb line here. Take another shot on the ground and we've got our plumb line here. And what I really wanted to illustrate was whenever we take measurements on the ground, we really have three different distances that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a horizontal ground distance, we're dealing with a ellipsoid distance, and we're also dealing with a grid distance. So this is you know a little bit out of scale just to show you guys the uh, the different distances that we have here. But this is kind of the light bulb moment for me. I remember when I was a, a surveyor still in the field some years ago, and I'd hear guys talk about grid coordinates. I'd hear them talk about ground coordinates, scale factors, and it really didn't make any sense to me. And then I, I looked at a book on the application of the the, uh, the development and application of the state plane survey uh, state plane survey system written by Gary Thompson, who's the chief at the North Carolina Geodetic Survey. And he had some cross-section examples like this. And that's when I realized, hey, there's really different surfaces. And depending on what surface we're on, we're getting a different distance. So if we're up on the ground, we've got one distance. Along the ellipsoid, we've got another distance. And down on the grid, we've got yet another distance. And again, depending on where you are, this might be higher or lower, right? We might be scaling up or down. But we've got two measurements on the ground, but instead of having one distance, depending on what surface we're working on, we actually have three. And we simply use scale factors to get those distances correct. So that was a, a big light bulb moment for me when I saw this and understood two measurements on the ground, instead of having one distance, we could have three in this example, and we're just using scale factors to go back and forth. Now, as land surveyors, we're primarily uh, concerned with the ground and the grid. Geodesists do all their work on the ellipsoid, but we're going to concentrate on the ground and the grid. So there's a couple of different scale factors that we're concerned with. The first one is our elevation factor, and that's what gets us from the ground down to the ellipsoid. Then we have what NGS on their data sheets calls the scale factor, which goes from the ellipsoid down to the grid. If we take those two and multiply them together, we get what's called the combined factor. And I'm sure most of you guys have seen or heard the, the term combined factor before. You see it on the NGS data sheets. You hear people talk about it in surveying circles. The combined factor is what we need to go from the ground down to the state plane grid. The inverse of the combined factor is what we use to go from the grid back up to the ground. So we'll see that in Trimble Access and, and Trimble Business Center when we see a, a, uh, a ground scale factor listed in there. That's the inverse of the combined factor. So just remember, you've got the elevation factor and the scale factor, and those create the combined factor, which allows us to go back and forth from grid to ground. So one misconception I hear a lot is, Hey, if I'm working down around the coast where I don't have much elevation, I really don't have to worry about scale factors too much. I get that phone call every now and then. This is a monument in North Carolina, DK3494, which is in Buxton, North Carolina, out near uh, the Cape Hatteras Monument, or Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, excuse me. And you'll see that you've got an elevation of just under eight and a half feet. So, yeah, there's not very much elevation out there and some guys think, oh, if I don't have very much elevation, I really don't need to worry too much about scale factors. But remember, there's there's two scale factors that come into play with your combined factor, your elevation factor and your actual scale factor to the grid. So if I look down here, not much elevation, elevation factor is small. 
But my scale factor, because this is right in the middle of North Carolina, right in the middle of that Lambert uh, projection, we've got a lot of, of scale factor going on from the ellipsoid to the grid. So my combined factor is 0.9998, and if I round eight, so that's 1,200 per thousand feet. That's a pretty significant difference between a grid coordinate and a ground coordinate. If you if you were to traverse, you know, even say a mile, that's over six tenths of difference between grid and ground. So just because you're working near the coast, don't think that you don't have to worry about scale factors. Again, it's the elevation factor and the scale factor. And then, you know, if you're somewhere like out in the Rockies or something where you've got a lot of elevation, depending on where you are on the grid, you could have a whole lot of scaling going on, right? So that was just a, a real quick run through, basic introduction. And again, for me, the light bulb went off when I saw that cross section example and just understood two measurements on the ground doesn't equal one distance. There's multiple, like, you know, up to three distances we could be working with. And we're really just using scale factors to go back and forth. So now, like I said, what I really want to do is more practical demonstration stuff, taking a look at Trimble Access and then Trimble Business Center, and how do I set my coordinate systems up in the data collector and in the office to get the results that I want. So the first thing is scale factor only, which is not really even using a coordinate system. But I bring this up just to, to make sure people understand the right way to set their data collector up when they're working with certain coordinates like assumed coordinates or if you want horizontal ground distances. That's what the scale factor only setting is really for. Don't ever put assumed coordinates or local site, you know, here in the US we surveyors call them assumed coordinates, but local site coordinates where we might make something up like a 5,000, 10,000 and key it in there. Don't put that in a real projection. That's a phone call I get probably once a month and I've seen errors five, six feet in length due to the fact that people are putting in assumed coordinates into a real coordinate system. So don't do that. When you have assumed coordinates, use a scale factor only. We can put in a scale factor of one, and then whatever ground distance we measure with the gun, there's no scaling going on, so that's what we're gonna get in our coordinates. With assumed coordinates, again, scale factor of one works great. You can also use it a scale factor only projection if you have a published combined factor for the job. And remember, a combined factor goes from the ground down to the grid. And I run into DOTs every now and then or counties that might have a combined factor for the whole county or a combined factor for a certain project. And then you can key in that combined factor into your, your uh, job setup and then all your total station distances will get scaled down to the grid based on that combined factor. So that's another time you'd use the, uh, the scale factor only. Now, scale factor only jobs generally can't be used with GNSS without a site calibration. And for those of you who aren't familiar with site calibrations, that's when you take a measurement with your GPS on a known coordinate that's a known grid coordinate on the ground. And the site calibration creates a relationship between those known uh, latitudes and longitudes coming from the GPS creates a relationship with the assumed coordinates or the local site coordinates that you have on the ground. That's a whole nother topic, so we're not gonna get into site cows today, but uh, just know that scale factor only is generally gonna be used when we're using a total station. So I'm gonna break into Trimble Access real quick. Let me open that up on my computer. So I've got an emulator running here on my computer, and the first thing I'm gonna do is just go in and show you guys how to set up a scale factor only job. So I'm gonna go under jobs and new job, and I'm gonna give this a job name of job number one, keep it simple, and go under my coordinate system and choose scale factor only. Now this is probably the easiest coordinate system you're ever gonna set up in your life. Go under scale factor only and put in the scale factor you need. In this case, we're gonna start with a scale factor of one, Again, this is what you're going to use when you're using a total station and you want one-to-one -one distances. So the total station measures 1,000 feet, you get 1,000 feet. Your coordinates aren't being scaled at all. This is what you want to use when you want horizontal ground coordinates with a total station or you're, uh, and you're not mixing it with GPS data or you, uh, you're using assumed coordinates. This is where it's going to come in handy. So I'll go ahead and hit enter and store there. Now, one thing I like to tell people is when I'm training folks is make sure your, your COGO settings are set up 
in the same coordinate system you're using. Again, this isn't going to affect your coordinates in your point manager, but when you do an inverse, if your Kogo is set to ground, you want to get ground distances if you're working in ground. And also if you're calcing up points inside Kogo, you want to you want to play with apples and apples. You want to use ground distances for any of your Kogo measurements there. So I always tell people, if you're setting up a ground system, be sure to set your Kogo settings to, uh, to ground as well. Now in this case, it's not a huge deal because we're just doing a scale factor of one, so there's no scaling going on, all right? So I'll just go ahead and hit accept there. So now we have a project set up just using a scale factor of one, and I want to take a measurement real quick and show you guys how that's going to affect our coordinates. So I'll go to manual mode, go to station setup, and hook up to my imaginary robot. Sorry, she's running a little bit slow this morning. There she goes. Now I'm not going to put in any corrections and I'm not saying don't use corrections, okay? So don't go call Joe or, or anybody else and say, hey, Mark White said don't use corrections. I do believe in corrections, but if I put in some correction information, it's going to, you know, change my coordinate values by some slight amounts. And I want you guys to see, just be able to see exactly what I'm doing here. And as, as I enter in a, uh, a scale factor, it affects the coordinate systems in a certain way, but I don't want my corrections doing that. So again, not saying don't use corrections, I'm just gonna leave them out this morning for this uh, demonstration. So I'll go ahead and accept that. I'm gonna put in an instrument point name of one, a, uh, an instrument height of six, and then I'm just gonna key in and assume coordinate like 10,000, 5,000. Again, that's the kind of thing that you'd wanna use this coordinate system for, or maybe you have some, some real coordinates that have been scaled up to ground. That's when you'd wanna use a scale factor of one. 500 on my elevation enter that and accept it. Then I'm going to shoot a backside point number two, throw in six for the height so I get a, a nice straight shot. Zero azimuth so we can see what how the coordinates are being affected easily. Enter that. Now I'll zero the gun and I'm going to take a thousand foot measurement for all these demos just so that we can see how the scale factors are working in there, get a nice long distance on it. So I'll go ahead and enter and accept that. So I took a 1,000 foot shot and I might add a scale of one, so my coordinates should be a thousand foot different, right? So I'll go ahead and store that. Station setup completed. Station setup's completed, and we'll go to job, and we'll go to our point manager, and we can see our northing of point number one was 10,000, our northing of point number two was 11,000. So again, this is what you wanna use if you're using assumed coordinates, you want ground distances with your total station, there's not any scaling going on. It's simply a scale factor of one. Seems pretty obvious, but you'd be amazed at how many phone calls I get from guys that, you know, things are screwed up because that's what they were looking for, but they set their project up in state plane or some other coordinate system. So just keep in mind when you want to use this. So I'll go ahead and escape here. and We're going to set up another job real quick and enter in an average combined factor. So I'm going to call this job number two. We'll go to coordinate system again. Again, I'm going to use scale factor only. But this time I'll just type in, you know, a made up combined factor like 0.9998. Enter that, store it. Now, in this case, I'm actually working with grid coordinates, right? Because I'm entering in an average combined factor. That's what we use to go from ground to grid would be a combined factor. So I want to flip over to my Kogo settings real quick and set them to grid so that if I do do any inverses, or you know, calculate any points, I'm getting grid on that. Again, that doesn't necessarily, or it doesn't affect what you're actually measuring. This is Kogo settings here. So I'll just accept that. And we'll run through that same setup real quick and see how this affects our distances by adding a scale factor in here. So I'll go to station setup. Again, I'm gonna leave the corrections blank for this. Point number one again six feet on the height, and I'll do that same 10,000, 5,000, and 500 for my elevation. Enter that in. Point number two for my back sight, six feet on the height, zero the azimuth, and we'll go ahead, zero the gun, and take another 1,000 foot shot. Enter that in. So I've got a 1,000 foot shot with the instrument. I'll go ahead and store that, and then we'll go take a look at our point manager, and you see now, instead of getting a thousand feet, even though that's what I measured, it's been scaled down to 
999.8 feet. All right, so that scale factor is coming into play. So again, this is what you would want to use if you've got a, a DOT project or say a county or just you want to go from grid to ground, you're using a total station um, and you have an average combined factor, all your data is going to get scaled by that average combined factor there. So let's take a look real quick at a COGO there. We'll go from one tab two and we get that 999.8 feet. Now if I go under my options and change my options over to ground, you'll see now I get that thousand feet. So we can see how that scale factor is affecting our measurements, right? Next thing I want to do is take a look at setting a project up in state plane coordinates and see how that affects our data. So I'll go to new job and this is going to be job number three. See a pattern developing there. This time we're going to go to select from library and I'm going to enter in the system. Now in the library you've got all the systems for all, all over the world. Every known coordinate system is in there. So we'll scroll down to the bottom for today's example. We're going to use U.S. State Plane 1983. My project coordinates are in Georgia West, so I'll select Georgia West. I am going to use a geoid model. Remember we talked about this earlier. The, the geoid model represents mean sea level and the software is going to use it in some of its calculations. So if you don't use a geoid model, you will see some, some slight differences in your coordinates. I'm going to go ahead and select geoid 12B, which is the latest geoid here in the United States. Now last time I was in here doing something, it was set to ground coordinates, but this job we're actually going to base on grid coordinates, our first job. Then we'll take a look at, at scaling up to ground. So one thing I really like to hammer home to people is However you set this up in Access or TBC, if you set it up for grid coordinates, you're going to get grid coordinates. I run into a lot of surveyors who have a misconception that if I do a job, even though I set it up for state plane and grid, if it's with a total station, I'm going to get ground coordinates. No, the software is going to scale it based on what you set it up for here. So if I set it to grid, I'm going to get grid. If I'm using GNSS, I'm going to get grid. If I'm using total station, I'm going to get grid. Everything's going to be scaled to grid in Access or TVC. Now that's a beautiful thing because you don't have to set up two different jobs, one for the total station, one for the, the uh, GNSS. You can have one project and everything's going to get scaled to grid if you want to work in grid. Now the other thing down here is my project height. So project height is, again, if, if you ever see the word height in Trimble software, that's looking for a height above ellipsoid or a height an ellipsoid height, not necessarily an elevation. Where I live, that's about 97, 96 feet below uh, ground elevation. But this is looking for a project height, and this is critical if you're doing 2D total station surveys. If you've got null elevations on a total station survey, then the software Trimble Access or Trimble Business Center will use the project height to do the calculations it needs to to go from grid to ground where it needs elevation factor in there. If you're doing a 3D survey, this isn't such a big deal. You just want something close, but it is critical if you're doing a 2D total station survey, okay? So I'll just put in 1003. That's pretty average for my office as far as an ellipsoid height. So I've got U.S. State Plane. Georgia West, I did use a geoid model. My coordinates are set to grid, so I'm going to get grid coordinates out of everything. And my project height, I've got entered in at 1003. I'll enter that, store it. Now I've got a, uh, I do want to link a control point in here so I don't have to type a long state plane coordinate in here in front of you guys and have you wait on that. This is a grid job, so I want to make sure that my COGO settings are set to grid. And you'll see there's an option in here for sea level correction. That is that elevation factor. That's telling the software to go ahead and, and do the, uh, the elevation scale factor in there as well. So I want to make sure that's checked. It's checked by default, but I just want to make sure that's checked. Hit accept there. Accept. And now we'll run through our, uh, our setup one more time and see how that thousand foot distance gets affected using state plane coordinates. So I'll go to station setup, connect up to my robot. Must be some radio interference this morning. Not connecting too fast. <laughs> Last time it connected right up. This is the fun part of doing live stuff, right? There she goes. 
So again, I'm not going to fill out corrections for this. Hit accept, put in a point number one, and there's my coordinates for the state plane coordinates there. Instrument height of six. You guys are thinking, hey, I've seen this before. Height of six on my back sight, zero out the azimuth, zero the gun, and I'm going to take that thousand foot distance shot again. Enter that, accept it. So again, I've got a thousand feet that I've measured here on the ground, but I'm set up for state plane grid, so I should see some scaling going on. Store here. And now let's take a look at our coordinate and how it got affected. So you'll see here, I've got almost 1,500 worth of, uh, of distance difference between ground and grid on this shot. I measured a thousand feet. I'm at about an 1,100 foot elevation at my office, and I'm pretty close to the middle of the, uh, the zone for Georgia West. So I've got some elevation factor going on, I've got some scale factor going on, and over a thousand feet I've got about 1,500 hundredths of distance. So again, think about a mile long traverse. You know, you take that and there's over seven tenths of difference, seven, eight tenths of difference between grid and ground in something as short as a mile long traverse. And this is where I get questions from guys, you know, hey, I, I set up some points with my GPS, they were in state plane, then I traversed between two pairs and I'm out a couple of feet because guys didn't understand they were running their total station in scale factor of one, they were setting their GPS in state plane. One of the beautiful things about Trimble software is I can run it all in the same project. I don't have to set up two different projects for my total station and for my GNSS. I can set it to grid and I get all grid. I can set it to ground, I get all ground and everything works nicely together because there is a pretty significant difference there. Okay, so that was state plane grid. Now let's take a quick look at how to set up a job in state plane, but actually scale everything to ground. So I'm gonna go to new job. This is gonna be job number four. I'm gonna go under my coordinate system. I'm gonna stay and select from library, go to next. This time, still in US state plane, uh, Georgia West, use a geoid model. This time I'm going to go under my coordinates and I've got two different ways I can set it up for a ground uh, a ground coordinate system. If I have the, the uh, ground scale factor, I have a project location, somebody's giving me all that information, I can simply key it in there. Or I can use the ground calculated scale factor, so if I have a G GPS unit I'm hooked up to, or I've got a point the job that I can use, I can use that information to set up my, my ground system. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to go to the ground calculated scale factor. I've got a here button. When I use that here button, if I'm hooked up to a GPS unit, I can get an autonomous position for where I am, and it's going to use that to create my ground coordinate system. Or I can use the point button here, and if I have points in the job that I've already measured, I could use them. Let me move that, and I'm going to go to page two. This is where the ground coordinate system settings really are. So the first thing is your project location, and this is really important to understand here. Your project location is where grid and ground are going to be equal, and all your distances are going to be scaled out from this location. Okay, so on a small site, it might not be too critical where you put your project location, but if you have a larger site, you would want this project location to be centrally located so that your scaling you know, is uniform as it scales out from this point. The other thing would be the elevation of your project location. If you're working on a pretty flat site, it's not going to be so critical, right? But this is going to be used to calculate that elevation factor that we talked about earlier. So if I'm working on a site that has a lot of slope on it, maybe I'm working in a mountainous region and you know one side of the the, uh, the site has a thousand foot difference from the other site. I'd want to choose an elevation in here and put an elevation in here that is a mean elevation for the site so that I get an average eleva elevation factor for the site. So keep that in mind. Your project location is important horizontally and vertically. Now I've also got a place for a false northing offset and a false easting offset. You can put numbers in here to basically offset your coordinates so that somebody looking at the coordinates won't be confused as to whether they're grid or ground. If I change them by you know, a few hundred thousand feet, somebody might look at them and go, okay, I see these, these must be you know, 
ground coordinates because he shifted them over and put a false northing or false easting in there. I'm not going to do that right now, but I'm going to go ahead and hit on the here button here, and that's going to give me fill out my coordinates. And when I do that, it's going to calculate my ground scale factor. Again, the ground scale factor is the inverse of the combined factor. So now all my data, whether it's total station data or GPS data, is going to get scaled from this project location. The distances are going to get scaled from this project location by this scale factor. So that's going to scale everything from grid to ground. All right. So I'll go ahead and store that. Oh, one other thing that I, I really need to throw out there. This project location is only good for this project. I've had guys go do a here position on one job, set it up for ground coordinates, then go, you know, 200 miles away the next day and set up a project using the same project location and wonder why all their distances were off. You need a project location for each individual project. All right, so don't try to use this project location on another project. This is specific to your project. So I'll go ahead and store that. I'm going to keep my linked file in here with my control point. I am going to set my Kogo settings over to ground. Again, this is just a habit I try to get people in so that you know, you're singing off the same sheet in the hymnal. And you'll see that your sea level correction is automatically set to yes. When we go to, to working with a real projection like state plane and we're going from, from grid to ground, we have to have that sea level correction in there because we have to calculate the elevation factor. So I'll go ahead and hit accept there, accept it again, and we'll go ahead and hook up to our gun and do one more station setup for you. Hey, it worked quick that time. No corrections, I'll hit accept so that you can see that when we take a ground measurement with total station now, we'll see how the coordinates are affected. I'll go to a instrument height of six, backsight point two, six, zero the azimuth. We'll go ahead and zero the instrument. And again, we're gonna take that same 1,000 foot shot, enter it in, accept it. So I got 1,000 feet, but I'm set up for state plane. We'll see how that ground scale factor works when I go under job, point manager, I got my thousand feet, right? So again, everything's in ground. If I set it for ground, I get ground. If I set it for grid, I get grid. I can use total station data, GPS data, all in the same project and access for TBC. That's one of the beautiful things about the software. Set it to grid, get grid, set it to ground, get ground. All right? So hopefully that helped clear up, you know, some of the confusion that comes with setting up coordinate systems in Trimble Access. Now let's flip back over to the slideshow real quick and talk about Trimble Business Center. So it's going to follow along with Trimble Access, right? And it should. So we've got uh, scale only that we can do. Again, we're going to use these for horizontal ground distances, assume coordinates, or we can put in that average combined factor and go from ground down to grid. And then we're going to take a look also at how to project our data to a known coordinate system, in this case, state plane coordinates. We're only going to use this when we have real coordinates. We use real coordinate systems with real coordinates. Don't throw your local site or assume coordinates into a real coordinate system. It will cause problems. Now, we can use this for grid or ground coordinates again, and I'll show you how to set it up to use your local site settings to scale to ground, just like we just did in Access. So I've got TBC open, a couple of projects. I'll go ahead and open up a blank project in TBC. Go to start new project. And when we get our template, you'll see we get some default templates that show up in three different units. We got international feet, metric, and US survey foot. And you'll see that each one of those has an option for scale only. That's what you want to use whenever you've got that scale only project from access or you want to do a scale only project in TBC. So if I choose US survey foot, that's going to preload TBC, if you will, with the information it needs to set up a projection. When I do scale only, we're doing flat earth surveying. We're just using rectangular coordinates in a scale only projection. So I'm going to choose US survey foot scale only, click on OK and let TBC open up. So once it opens up, we'll take a look at our coordinate system settings real quick. Our coordinate system is set to scale only. 
and our projection is set to a scale factor of one. It's in blue, so anything in blue can be edited there. I could change the scale factor however I need it. But we're going to take a look at that first job we did in Access. So that's going to be a scale projection of one there. I'll click on OK, and we'll pull in that first scale only job that we did in Trimble Access. I'll go to job one, bring it in. And anytime I'm working with a scale only definition, it's going to give me a chance to define that scale factor when I bring it into TBC. I want to keep it at one for this example, but again, I could edit it. I'll click on OK there. And you'll see we only had those two points in the job, right? Point number one and point number two. But let's take a look if we do a quick inverse between them and just make sure that uh, you know TBC is working like access. We set it to a scale factor of one. We took a thousand foot shot. So we should have a thousand feet on these coordinates, right? So if I click there and do a quick inverse, you'll see my grid distance and my ground distance are both a thousand feet. And that's because there's no scaling going on. There's no difference between grid and ground there. So we get a thousand foot on each of them. And if I look at my points and look at the coordinates for number two, you'll see there it is at 11,000 feet. So I started with 10,000 on one. I took a thousand foot shot and I'm getting um, that thousand foot reflected in my coordinates. You'll also see all I have is a grid coordinate. When I do a scale only definition, I'm not working with a real projection. I don't have an ellipsoid model, so I don't have latitudes and longitudes or local coordinates for that point. I just get my rectangular coordinates. So let me create another project real quick. Go to new. I'm going to do US survey foot scale only again. I'm not going to save my changes. And we'll take a look at what happens when we use that, uh, that average combined factor like we did in the field in job two. So I'll go back up to my coordinate system. Again, scale only. But this time, for the scale factor, I'm going to put in that 0.9998. Click on OK and go ahead and import that second job we did. Again, it has, gives me the chance to change that if I needed to, but I'm going to leave it at 0.9998. And when we do a quick inverse, we'll see that now we've got a grid distance. Uh-oh, I screwed something up, didn't I? Okay, well, I guess I clicked on space. Sorry about that. <laughs> Again, that's the fun of doing stuff live, right? So heart stop, stop beating there for a minute. But you go to a grid distance of 999.8 and a ground distance of 1,000 feet. Still no ellip ellipsoid distances there because we're not working with a real projection. But you'll see that we do have um, the scaling going on. And if we look at our coordinates for point number two, you'll see that instead of 11,000, it's 10,999.8. So again, we're scaling from the ground down to the grid using that average combined factor. So let's look at uh, one more, or actually got two more projects, but we'll take a look at uh, using a state plane grid projection. So this time I'm just gonna choose the US survey foot, not scale only, but we're gonna work with a real projection. So I'll go to US survey foot and click on okay. Not going to save my changes there. And now we'll go up under our project settings and go to coordinate system. And you'll see instead of just scale only, we've got the option of putting in projection information there. So I'll go to the change button. I've got a list of recently used coordinate systems there, but I'm going to go to coordinate system and zone. Let me move this over a little bit so you can see everything in the list. We're going to use US State Plane 1983, just like we did in the data collector. Got Georgia West here. Next, we are going to use GOA 12B, and I'm going to set it over to survey quality. And this gives you a chance to put in the vertical datum name. You don't have to, but just to let anybody know what vertical datum you were using here, this is more metadata than anything. I'll leave that blank for right now. So now you'll see my coordinate system group is set up to US State Plane. Georgia West, NAT83, GOA12B, and I'm working in grid now. There's a couple of different ways I can tell whether I'm working in grid or ground. Under local site, you'll see it says use ground coordinates, no. So not using ground coordinates. The other option is down here at the bottom of the screen. It says grid down at the bottom next to US survey foot. So I know again, I'm working in grid coordinates, not ground. So I'll just go ahead and click on okay there. 
and we will import in job number three from the data collector. And it's throwing up a little warning. Anytime you get this, it's always good to look at the details. It's just telling me there's something different between what I did on the data collector and what I did in the office. So I'll click on the details here. Don't ever bypass that because you never know. It could be something minor. It could be something major. So scroll down. Any, anything that's different is going to be in yellow. And what it is is I put that 1,003 foot height in my data collector and when and when I set it up in the office I didn't put a height in I just set up the coordinate system so this really is a minor thing but always check that when you get that uh, when you get that pop-up I'm gonna keep the existing project definition for this and click on OK and again I've just got my two points so if I do a quick inverse now I should get that state plane grid distance I believe that was like 999.852 yep and I get a ground distance of a thousand foot, but now I get to see what my ellipsoid distance is since I'm using a real projection. Remember we said two points on the ground, one measurement's actually given us three distances, right? And we explained why. So we got a ground distance that we shot of a thousand feet. We've got an ellipsoid distance of 999.95 and a grid distance of 999.85. So that shows you we were pretty close to the center of that state plane zone because the distortion limit at the middle of a transverse Mercator zone is one in 10,000 and we're right at a tenth of a foot in a thousand feet. So my office is pretty close to the to the center of the grid there. And then if I look at my coordinates for number two, you'll see there's that 999.85 foot change. But I also get, because I'm working in a real coordinate system, I get local coordinates and I get global coordinates. So local coordinates are my NAT83 coordinates, and then this is my WGS84 coordinates there. All right, so that was state plane. So now let's look at, okay, I've got state plane, but I wanna set it up um, for ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up another TBC project that I already have open that has some points in it, so we can take a look at that. Now this isn't a huge project. You can see the scale bar, it's 100 feet right there, so it's, I don't know, probably about 400 feet across. This is actually in um, New Mexico, I believe. It's from a training class I did a few years ago. And so if I go to coordinate system, you'll see US State Plane 1983. It's in the New Mexico Central Zone. And right now, these are grid coordinates. Again, it says grid under local site. And it says grid down here at the bottom. So how do we scale these up to ground coordinates or down to ground coordinates, depending on where we are, right? But how do we scale these to ground coordinates? couple of different ways I can go under the survey tab and choose local site settings or here for my project settings I can choose local site settings so I'm just going to go from there then this is just like Trimble Access we need to define our project location and keep in mind again this is where the scaling is going to occur from so it, this is an important step on a small project like this I could just pick something like the base point because I'm only going 400 feet. On a larger project, I might want to pick a more centralized point, and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But I can just go in here, highlight in uh, my coordinate box, and then come over and click on the coordinate that I want to use for my project location. You'll see that uh, populated the northing and easting, but it didn't populate the elevation. And that's because they want, you know, the software is written to make you do that in another step so that you do have to stop and think and not just click on a point and get an elevation, but make sure you're using a mean elevation for your project since this is what's going to be used to create your elevation factor. So once I've defined my project location, I can check the box for use ground coordinates. I can tell the software I want to compute the ground scale factor from this location, or I can type in my own scale factor right but just remember this is the the ground scale factor so this is the inverse of your your combined factor here again I could set false easting false northing just like in access in this case I'm gonna leave that blank and then I'll go ahead and click on OK and you see everything blink it recomputes the project now all these distances have been scaled from point number 12 to give me ground distances instead of grid and you'll see down here at the bottom of the screen, it now says I'm working in ground coordinates. One thing I always like to do is go um, under my reports and just create a quick point list and save this off somewhere because this is going to 
just give me a uh, a record of what I did there, my project location, what my scale factor was. It's just a quick way to do it. Run your points report, and that'll give you this information here. It tells me that I'm working in U.S. State Plane, and then it tells me what my local site settings were, my latitude, longitude, height, scale factor, if I had any kind of offsets. And then I can just save that off, export that out as a Word document, a PDF, stick it in my survey folder, and if I ever have to come back to it, I've got that information. Okay. Could also save that off, obviously, but this gives you something written to work with. Now I'm going to undo that and we'll go back to grid coordinates real quick. If you were working on a larger project and you wanted to use a mean of all the points in the project, since since we are uh, since we added the average points command, an easy thing you can do is just select all the points in the project, go to F12 and open the command pane and start typing in average, and you'll get average points. And then I've got all these points in the project selected, and what I'm going to do is average them together to get an, a, a mean project location. So I'll go to just a point number that's way outside all the other ones, give it a feature code of project location, and then I'll tell it to go ahead and compute that point. So now you'll see I get a point ten thousand here in the middle that is a, a mean of all those points in the job. It's not exactly in the middle. Let me close my average points. But now if I wanted to use that, again, I could go to settings or I could go to the survey tab. This time I'll do it under survey tab, local site settings, and pick point number 10,000 for the horizontal. I'll go ahead and use it for the vertical as well. Tell it I want to use ground coordinates, have TBC compute the ground scale factor, and click on OK there. So now everything's been scaled from a more central location out. I'll hit undo button one more time, um, just because that's that mean because everything's kind of weighted to the north and the east side of the project. If I wanted to get something that was more in the middle, I could always just hold the control button down and pick points that are along the corner corners of the project. So I'll do 87, 123, 138 and then 52 down here. And this will give me something that's kind of more in the middle. Again, go to F12 and type in average. And actually, since I just used it, I could right click and gotten to it as well. Another nice feature there. Put in point number 10,000, feature code of project location. Whoops. I went to East Carolina, they didn't teach us how to spell. Project location, compute that. And now I've got a point that's a little more centrally located, right? Because I picked kind of the four corners of the box there. So again, I could go under my local site settings. I'm in grid right now. Choose point number 10,000 for the horizontal and the vertical. Tell it to compute there. Click OK. And now everything's been scaled to ground with a central location. So, go ahead and go back to my slideshow. So, before we get into next steps, I'll just kind of wrap up a little bit. I know that was kind of like drinking water from a fire hose. Uh, I was trying to talk as fast as I could to get everything in, but we really covered a lot there. We covered when do you scale factor only and why you'd want to use it, both in Access and TBC. You know, covered state plane coordinate systems in Access and TBC, and also using state plane and scaling it up to ground, and how to do that, and how to do it correctly. So hopefully you guys got a lot out of that. Um, uh, like I said, that, that comes from 11 and a half years of doing support for our customers and trying to answer people's questions, and, and hopefully that will help you guys get your coordinate system set up and have less problems between the field and the office. So Joe, I'll hand it back over to you for next steps. Thanks, Mark, and thank you. You did a great job getting a lot in. Um, so this is being recorded, and it will be posted. We, we run a, a sister session to this uh, in a few hours, so we'll take the uh, better of the two recordings, whichever ones that uh, maybe I don't trip over my words as much or, um, or whichever one Mark prefers, and we will post them for uh, your download and, and re-watching uh, capabilities later, and you will be notified of that uh, via email. Um, 
go ahead, Mark, with the next slide. Okay. So hopefully you liked what you heard here. You learned a lot. Um, we do these every month. So that's, it's always the, the last Wednesday of the month. Um, next, next month we've also got a, a hardcore survey classic topic of uh, using network adjustment versus traverse adjustment. We've done each of these sessions individually, but now we're going to put them head to head um, with our buddy Terry Clock, who is in the geospatial support team here in, um, in Westminster. He has uh, decades of, of field experience, so we're excited to have Terry on board to host uh, uh, August's uh, TVC Power Hour. Go ahead. All right, so TBC resources. If uh, you're new to TBC, we've got a lot of web-based resources for you to check out. Uh, user group on the TBC community page, which is a public site. Also the TBC Facebook page, a little bit more for announcements and things like that. Uh, we will also post tips of the week, uh, kind of these uh, uh, condensed versions of the power hours where we just take a single topic of TBC and kind of document it with some screenshots and go through that. Those, that program has been uh, remarkably successful so far as well. Uh, we have a long-standing YouTube channel. Um, the, the handle is TBC Survey. So take a look at that. I think there's about 200 videos there. Um, as we introduce new features in the TBC, we uh, go create the five, six, seven, eight minute video describing those features as well. And then the TBC Power Hour home, homepage, hopefully you're familiar with this. Uh, if not, uh, Boris and Riley and um, the Marcom team have been doing these Power Hours uh, since uh, 2015. So each month is archived there for you uh, to view. Go ahead, Mark. And if you like what you see and you don't have TBC, um, please encourage you to download it and contact your Trimble distribution partner for a demo license. Uh, that the, uh, if you don't know who your distribution partner is, there will be, there or there is links available on the download page or on Trimble.com for dealer locator. And then I would recommend start with work -based tuto workflow based tutorials included with TBC. Um, there's almost 30 I think now that are uh, PDF instructions step by step going through various topics and, and in-depth workflows similar to what you saw here today. Uh, take a look at our YouTube videos or uh, ask a question on the TVC community. So I believe that is it. Um, we've got a lot of questions, so um, <laughs> we Joe's, won't be able Joe's to gonna answer all the questions, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm looking, uh, we're looking for Boris here because he's, um, he's the geodesist. Um, yeah, Boris is uh, a smart guy. <laughs> um, but a couple of uh, uh, questions that came up kind of repeatedly, um, and especially right at the end there with, with getting your uh, uh, state plane or your projected system into ground coordinates, um, the concept of site calibration was not covered um, just due to time constraints. But the site calibration uh, is a great topic, uh, potential topic for a power hour. I just added that to the list. Um, but the site calibration gets your grid coordinates, your projected coordinates, into local ground, co um, ground coordinates. So that would be the way or a way to, to use multiple data sources such as Total Station and GNSS data in the same project. You don't need to create different projects um, either within TBC or Trimble Access to work with uh, different data types. Um, so a question came in uh, along those lines is, if you have a project designed in grid, how would you scale that data to ground um, from Ben? That Ben, the site calibration, uh, which would include multiple points basically matching and, and fitting grid-based uh, coordinates into the ground plane would be the way to do that. And also a way for, especially for smaller projects like Mark showed right there at the end, the local site settings, which is basically the equivalent of a one point site calibration where you'd want to use that one point that is kind of centrally located to the rest of your data. Um, there was one more that I wanted to get. Oh, 
Uh, the question came in from Ruben that when you select a coordinate system um, in the coordinate system library, is it possible to see what scale factor is applied? So the answer there is uh, yes, when you've got ground-based coordinates selected, it will show you um, the coordinate scale based on uh, your project location that Mark went through. So there's a, probably another dozen questions here or so we've got um, to answer. We've got them all archived and we've got the uh, person who asked them. So look for that answer from us here shortly. Uh, we just put up a poll and uh, we encourage you to respond. If you would like to be contacted by a Trimble distribution partner, we'll leave that up for another uh, 30 seconds or so. More? Sure. We'll do a couple more questions. Uh, Randy asks, when would you use a no uh, projection, no datum coordinate system? So I can answer this, and Mark, um, you probably get this a lot as well, but I've used that in a post-processing situation where I just got on site and I had no idea where I was, no coordinate system, uh, no nothing, no local site control. Um, could you speak to when the best case or when you've used or advice yeah. to use no projection, no datum? When I use it is when, you know, I've got so somebody else at control on a job, let's say for a uh, for a construction site or something like that, maybe a, a surveyor came out there and set the control and you really don't know what he set it in. Um, yeah, that's when I advise guys to do that, set it up, no projection, no datum, and then go out and do a site calibration to that to those control points because then that site calibration becomes your your projection and your datum there. So that's generally when I use that. You know, if I if I'm the land surveyor going out there and doing the work, usually I'm defining the coordinate system. So I'm going to do it in state plane, whether I do it at state plane, grid or ground, or I'm going to use some kind of scale factor if I'm using my own local coordinates, um, like a scale factor of one. But I use that no projection, no datum a lot when when I'm teaching people to do site cows when somebody else set the set the control out there and you take your GPS out there and it doesn't match up what you shoot off the VRS network doesn't match what they put on the ground set no projection no datum and let those control points define your projection and your datum through the site calibration great um, can you scroll down on the questions there was a follow-up similar to that uh, that was that was also asked. Oh, about about using um, uh, starting a job at uh, zero zero, and and kind of the pitfalls you get there. Um, <laughs> depending on the projection you use, the further away you get from your central um, projection point, your your project location, the greater the scale factors will be. The more distortion. Uh, Mark used the example of cutting a ball in half and trying to flatten that out to um, uh, onto a flat surface. So the further away you are from your um, your uh, uh, site uh, project site location, the greater the effect of that that combined scale factor will have. Yeah, and, and I'll throw in there too. You know, I, I see a lot of guys that aren't land surveyors that um, I joke with my friend Joel Cusick up in Alaska, ologist. You know that maybe. They, they use survey equipment to go to go do some work out in the field, but they'll set up a lot of zero, zero, zero coordinate systems. And the other thing you run into there, even if you're doing a local site, you've got a scale of one and you're using zero, 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 you, uh, you end up getting a lot of negative numbers and, and then things just don't work out too well. So most of the time, most land surveyors and, and guys that do a lot of mapping work try to stay away from zero, zero, zero projections just to stay out of the negative numbers. Yeah, we'll let the, we'll let the GIS guys uh, work, in, <laughs> work in zero, zero. Maybe they like negative numbers. That's why you see 5,000, 5,000 or 10,000, 5,000 or just an arbitrary coordinate system. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're a few minutes late or almost 10 minutes late. Sorry about that, but um, thank you for the really, really engaging session, Mark, and everyone else on the call. And uh, if you've got the time, we're going to do another one here at uh, 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Eastern uh, U.S. Time. 
and uh, look for the recording and, and uh, that notification from us. So thank you very much for your attendance. If, if this was your first uh, TBC Power Hour experience, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope, hope to see you again. And uh, if you're a seasoned veteran, thank you again for your, for your patronage and, and let us know how we're doing. Um, and Mark, I can't thank you enough, buddy. And uh, we'll, we'll be uh, seeing you here this afternoon. All right. Thanks, Joe. Look forward to it. All right. Take it easy, everyone.